Hi everybody, this is Andy. Welcome back to Med School EU. And in today's lecture, we're going to continue talking about genetics and more specifically, we will discuss molecular genetics and we will start off with DNA structure. So as uh, mentioned in previous lectures, DNA consists of nucleotides. So any genetic material, the most basic form of genetic material, is going to be nucleotides. And a nucleotide consists of three major components. So the two components that are invariable, they stay the same throughout all types of nucleotides because there are uh, four different types. So there's four different types of nucleotides. And in this case, so we have our phosphate and we have our five carbon sugar. In this case, it is deoxyribose because we are talking about DNA. And uh, in terms of this structure, this part, the phosphate and the, the uh, five carbon sugar are going to be invariable, meaning that they're not going to change. It's just going to continue being this uh, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar. And we call that sugar phosphate backbone. So it's sugar phosphate backbone. So this is a very important structure because it's going to be able to have these negative bonds on the phosphates. And this is how the phosphates are going to interact with different proteins uh, in structures like chromatin and be able to be packaged in very tight formations because of these negative, uh, negative uh, connotations with the oxygen. And that's all on the sugar phosphate backbone. Now this part is the variable part. This is the nitrogenous base and there's four different nitrogenous bases, meaning that there's four different nucleotides. And this first one right here that I'm showing is an adenine. An adenine, as you can see, it's uh, composed, of course, alternating carbon nitrogen, uh, hence the name nitrogenous base. And it has two rings to it. So you've got the ring one, Let's label it with another color. You've got ring one and ring two. And what's important about these is that there's two nitrogenous bases that are that have two rings and there's two nitrogenous bases that have just the one ring and they have specific names for them. So this one is called adenine. Adenine. And adenine is a purine. So we can label this as purine because it has two rings to it. Now, if we take a look at the next nitrogenous base, and this one's going to be guanine. And this one is also a purine because as you can see, it has two nitrogenous, these rings. So this is guanine. And it's also a purine because it's got rings to its nitrogenous base. So they're called purines. Adenine and guanine are purines. And looking at the next one, this is the, the, the first um, pyrimidine that we're going to take a look at because it's got only one ring for the nitrogenous base. And this one's going to be called thymine. So this is thymine. And the thymine is a pyrimidine. So P pyrimidine. And it's called a pyrimidine because it's got one ring to this nitrogenous space and it's called thymine. Now looking at the fourth nitrogenous base and this one is going to be called cytosine. And uh, this one also has just the one ring. So we know that it's a pyrimidine. So let's label that pyrimidine. And this is called cytosine. So as we can see, we've got four different nitrogenous bases that could be bonded to the five carbon sugar. In this case is deoxyribose. And of course the deoxyribose will have the bonding to the phosphate. Let's take a look at the some of the bonds. So first, we're going to label these bonds and uh, we're going to define this one. So this one that uh, combines the 
nitrogenous base and the five carbon sugar is going to be called a beta N glycosidic bond. So beta N glycosidic bond. And this bond, the significance of it is that it connects the nitrogenous base with the five carbon sugar. Now the next really important bond is going to be the phosphoester bond. And the phosphoester bond exists right here. So this right there is the phospho phosphoester bond. Now, the connection between two different nucleotides within one strand, so of course, we're going to go to uh, P right here, so this is going to be phosphate, and then we're going to go right back to the sugar. So the bond that is here, these two, the whole phosphate, and the phosphate, of course, is going to have one phosphodiester bond right here, and it's going to have another phosphodiester bond right here. So they're going to be called phosphodiester bonds. So this one is phospho. Let's let's do a different color here. Phospho diester bond. And this is the bond that we're going to see in particular on exams because this bond, the significance of it is it's basically the phosphate that's going to be the bridge between one sugar molecule and the next sugar molecule. And that bridge right here is, is, the, is the phosphodiester bond because it has a phosphate right in the middle of it and it has ester bond connected to one sugar and the other sugar. As we can see here, this is the phosphoester bond. However, there would be a sugar on the other side of it, making that a phosphodiester bond. So now let's also label some of the positioning here as well, because these carbon positions are going to be extremely important in identifying where things bond and recognizing how replication and transcription really occurs. So, uh, carbons would be labeled with the prime so one prime two prime three prime four prime and five prime so based on these positions of carbons we'll be able to identify which bond is where so the phosphodiester bond occurs right here on the five prime carbon and of course, the other side of the phosphodiester bond will be on the three prime carbon because we would have the phosphate here and then the next sugar molecule, right? So this, this would be the connection. Now, one of them is connected to the three prime position of the carbon and the other one is connected to the five prime carbon. And that's shown right here as well. So that's the importance of the five prime carbon. Now the one prime carbon here is, uh, is going to be the one that bonds towards the nitrogenous base. And so typically knowing these positions on the carbons, we could say that the phosphate, the phosphate group that's right here, will always be bonded to the five prime position of the carbon. And the, the uh, hydroxyl group, so typically we would have an OH here, the alcohol hydroxyl group, will be typically bonded to the three prime carbon. So that's, that's the significance here, is that the phosphate group will typically form a uh, phosphoester bond with the hydroxyl group and it's a condensation reaction which will produce water and uh, the significance of course is that the hydroxyl is always residing on the three prime and the phosphate is residing on the five prime carbon so now here i wanted to demonstrate the complementary base pairing of the nitrogenous basis because as we all know DNA exists in a double helix. Uh, it's, it's a double helix structure. So we could label this as double helix. 
and that's that's specifically DNA and uh, typically RNA would uh, exist as a single strand so it would not have any of these uh, attachments the hydrogen bonds here or it simply exists as one strand but even when it is synthesized as one strand it would still form hydrogen bonds to other parts of the RNA molecule making still some of these strands however they would not be in this uniform uh, anti-parallel arrangement as they are in DNA because DNA is synthesized as a double helix so let's take a look at the structure of double helix and first of all we're gonna uh, right off the bat we're gonna label the um, the positions so here we have the three prime position on the hydroxyl as mentioned previously we have the five prime position on the phosphate here and it's going to be anti-parallel bonding so remember this it's anti-parallel because on this side of the double helix it's going to be the three prime as you can see the hydroxyl group here and on this side it will be the five prime so as you can see, 5 prime, 3 prime, 5 prime, 3 prime, it is anti-parallel. Now, another thing that we're going to discuss and it's going to come up is Chargaff's rule. And what Chargaff's rule really states, so it's Char, Chargaff rule. And Chargaff's rule states that in between the adenine and thymine so this is going to be the adenine molecule right here and this is going to be the thymine molecule at it's going to base pair with two hydrogen bonds so there's there's two hydrogen bonds in between them as you can see one and two now if we're looking at the other two structures other two nitrogenous bases We've got the guanine and cytosine. And the guanine and cytosine, so this would be guanine and this would be the cytosine, they would have three hydro, uh, hydrogen bonds. So that, that's one, two, and three. So sometimes you're going to get questions where they're going to ask how many hydrogen bonds exist between a uh, this sequence of nucleotides and it's just going to be a sequence of nine maybe 15 nucleotides and you've got to identify how many at and gc bonds there are and then multiply each of those by their corresponding number of hydrogen bonds in between them so if you have for example you have three gc bonds and you have uh, four AT bonds then you're gonna know that it's gonna be four times two and it's gonna be three times three right here so nine eight and in total we're gonna have 17 hydrogen bonds between these seven nucleotides so let's just clear this up a little bit and discuss how Chargaff's rule is going to apply so if we have for example a a the complementary base is gonna be AT a T C G. So now we have to figure out how many hydrogen bonds are in between them. Now we know between A T, so A always binds to T, adenine binds to thymine, they're going to have two hydrogen bonds between them. And the cytosine with guanine will have three hydrogen bonds in between them. So let's count how many A T bonds. We have we have one two three four five we have five so it's going to be five times two and cg bonds we have one two three four five six seven and we have seven cg bonds and that's going to be multiplied by three so if we uh, come up with the number it's going to be 10 hydrogen H bonds from the uh, ATs and 7 times 3, 21 hydrogen bonds from the GC. And together combined, we end up with 31 H bonds 
in this uh, sequence of DNA. And of course, this is the double helix sequence. So these are very common questions that you would get on the exam. So you must understand how base pairing works, Chargaff's rule, ATCG. And uh, you must understand how many hydrogen bonds are in between each and which one is pyrimidine, which one is a purine. So we've got the adenine and guanine, that is purines purines because they have two rings to them and we have the uh, thymine and cytosine as the pyrimidines pyrimidines because they only have one ring and you're always going to get a purine binding with a pyrimidine as you can see here at that's Purine bonded to pyrimidine, CG, that's purine bonded, uh, pyrimidine bonded to purine. Uh, so that's, that's the importance of this lesson here, just knowing the structure of the nucleotides, uh, knowing how they work, and knowing how, which bonds are between them, and how are they connected, because that's going to be important in the next lesson, when we talk about DNA replication, as well as um, protein synthesis and this is going to come up quite often in the next lesson so I am assuming that you have watched this video and you know what's going on uh, so that I'm not going to go back to explaining what the pyrimidines and the purines and all of the bonds associated with them now if uh, another thing that I must mention about uh, nucleotides and the terminology is that Sometimes what comes up is we have the phosphate, right? We have the sugar and we got the um, nitrogenous base. So we'll put nitrogen here. And of course they have, they're bonded like this. Now this whole structure, the whole basic unit is a nucleotide. However, if we only have the sugar and the nitrogenous base without the phosphate this is going to be called nucleoside so this is nucleoside without the phosphate bonded to the sugar and nucleosides of course here they have the beta and glycosidic glycosidic bond so another uh, sequence of terminology that's going to be important is the nucleoside and the difference with the nucleotide with the phosphate. This is nucleotide, the most basic structure of uh, DNA molecule. However, nucleosides is uh, something that comes up in, in the terminology as well. So this concludes our lesson on the uh, DNA structure. And in the next one, we're going to still continue talking about molecular genetics as we will for a while at this point and uh, we will specifically take a look at the replication of DNA.